Welcome to Prime Time, a show for adults in the prime of life. I'm Susan Hoskins, the director of the Princeton Senior Resource Center. We're a nonprofit organization providing programs and services to older adults, their families, and caregivers in the greater Princeton area. You can also visit our website at princetonsenior.org. Our contact information will be on at the end of the show. You can also visit us at the Suzanne Patterson Building or at Spruce Circle, where we do programs and provide information and social services. Today, we'll be talking about older adult sexuality. My guest is Susie Wilson. Susie had a career in working on child and adolescent sexuality and is on the board of the Consortium of Sexuality and Education, which is starting up very soon at Widener College in Pennsylvania. Um, she also writes a weekly column called Sex Matters for a website, NewJerseyNewsroom.com. And Susie, I know as I've come to know you that one of your particular areas of interest nowadays is older adults and sexuality, which is a topic that's very hard for people to talk about. And you worked with a group who put together this manual, we'll put up the information at the end of the show about it, on older adult sexuality. Because much like when we were teens and we weren't sure where to get the right information, as older adults, we also don't know where to get information about um, the situations that we're running into. And a lot of people seem to think that sex just stops somewhere <laughs> after childbearing. So maybe that's a place to start. Welcome, Susie. Thank you, Susan. Thanks so much for asking me. I'm just delighted to be able to talk about uh, the Consortium for Sexuality and Aging. And uh, it's a wonderful new endeavor. And, um, I, you know, we all are sexual from birth to death, but somehow, in this society anyway, we sort of put brackets around it, uh, it, it put a lot of emphasis on adolescent sexuality, and then we sort of forget about it. Yeah. Everybody seems to be very aware of adolescent sexuality and their concerns about kids being sexualized earlier and earlier, but we really do have very active sex lives throughout life, don't we? Absolutely. I don't know. I, I look at the style page in the New York Times on Sundays, mm -hmm. and it's amazing to me the number now of, of announcements of marriages uh, of people in their 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. And I actually knew a man in, in a couple of weeks ago who was 85, who was marrying a woman who was 90. So oh, <laughs> things yeah. are changing. Well, I think that's an important point, too, because sometimes we think or we hear on the news of older men marrying younger women, you know, an 80-year-old man where marrying a 40-year-old woman or something. But one of the things that many people experience is loneliness and mm -hmm. wanting companionship and wanting physical contact. And some of the widows and widowers that I talk to talk about that being one of the things that they miss the most is just the touch. Somebody hugging you in the morning, somebody putting a hand on your shoulder when you are troubled by something. Well, you're absolutely right. And this curriculum, which are 30 lessons, um, it sort of in starts with sort of sexual touch and goes all the way to mm -hmm. sexual toys. Mm -hmm. So, and a skin hunger is one of the lessons, and it's a marvelous lesson. It's just doing exactly what you're saying, how people crave human touch. Mm -hmm. And in it, um, there is a description of how to give someone you know or like or love a um, hand massage, just a hand massage, the idea that you were touching someone else's hand. It's really very beautiful, mm -hmm. and that is incorporated in one of these astounding lessons. They're all just wonderful. Tell me about what some of the other lessons are. Okay. Well, they're all, um, they're really all engaging and enlightening, I think. And what they try to do, which is what all good sex education curricula try to do, is give knowledge, 
sort of address attitudes, mm. talk about behaviors, and give people skills. And whatever age level you provide sex education, that's what you want to do. And that's what mm -hmm. these lessons do. They start out, some of them, about with the history of sort of sexuality mm -hmm. through the ages. I think there's, I think it's called sages and ages, for mm -hmm. instance. Yeah. So they get you started on sort of knowing what different behaviors or attitudes were about all of these issues, starting way back in ancient Egypt kind of thing. Um, they, they, there's a lot of, ta uh, there's a lot of emphasis on sort of new, new, new ideas going forward about sexuality and women 50 and over, sexuality and men. The whole idea that we do have desire. It's very much a part of humans as they age, and it does not go away. We can't suppress it. So I think that these lessons, there's an excellent one on masturbation, for example, mm -hmm. called a touchy subject. <laughs> <laughs> and again, it makes the point that it just explains what it is and what it isn't. Mm -hmm. um, it says if you don't like to do it, you shouldn't do it. But if you wish to engage in it or engage in it mutually with a partner or someone like that, there's nothing wrong with it. And it, again, it's touching and it makes you feel good and it makes your partner feel good. Well, there again, we're dealing with the attitude piece, aren't we? Because That's right. so many people, and, and I'm thinking about how when we talk about older adults, I've said before on the show that we're talking about three or four generations of older adults. So there are people in their 90s who were raised with one set of mores and 80s and 70s and 60s, just divi divided up that way. But that for many people, you weren't supposed to talk about sex, you weren't supposed to display sex, you weren't supposed, you know, it was always sort of dirty and hidden. And, and so I'm thinking that many older adults hear the term masturbation and they think, ooh, that's, that's dirty and creepy but they don't even know what's involved. Or if they say, you know, I have these feelings and I don't know what to do with them, they don't even know where to begin because it's always been pushed aside. So this book helps people get some basic education and information. Absolutely, and it gets you beyond um, the mysterious aspects of sex, mm -hmm. which because of our society, has been hidden and the shameful aspect yeah. so often people grow up uh, feeling ashamed of their feelings ashamed of their behaviors mm -hmm. and this book focuses on what's called sexual scripts almost every lesson um, uh, the students have a chance to get in touch with those messages that you were talking about that what they heard from their their parents or didn't hear from their parents or what they didn't tell their kids and then what they see today in the media because you have to come to terms with some of those uncomfortable negative feelings before you can go forward and mm -hmm. feel positive about engaging in loving pleasurable sexual activities. I'm thinking about this as, as you talk because um, my son is getting sex education at school this year oh. and one of his homework assignments a few weeks ago was to interview one of his parents <laughs> and to ask, so he, he came to me and he was asking questions that I thought were wonderful discussion opening questions that I didn't even have with my older son, let alone have with my parents at the time, but where did you learn about sex? You know, who did you learn about sex from? Um, what was your feeling as a teenager? Um, I don't know that, he t that there was a question about what were some of your experiences, but it just kind of opened up. Oh, when do you think people are old enough to have sex? Yeah. So it, they were wonderful opening questions, inviting mm -hmm. more conversation between us that was pretty novel. <laughs> Even in today's <laughs> well, it world. is. Not, uh, he's getting a really good sex edu education program. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, they're not all that good across the country. That's what right. we would aspire to. But there is a there is really a component of that in these lessons. So I mean, it's just the whole idea of 
of talking to people. It's really talking that's so important about this subject. And I know that in certain uh, assisted living communities and nursing homes, there's a lot of confusion on the part of staff about mm -hmm. how to handle uh, or what their they, own discomfort. Their own discomfort, <laughs> yeah. that's right. But also what they observe, right. and they get very uncomfortable with it. There's a, there is a, a lesson devoted to caregivers mm. in nursing mm -hmm. home settings, hospital settings. It seems and to family. Me. Someone was telling me the oh. other day about going to visit her mother. What was she telling me? That, that she went to visit her mother in the nursing home, and it was Christmas Eve, and their tradition was that on Christmas Eve they would go and take the gifts and they would open them or Christmas morning it might had to have been Christmas morning and they went to the nursing home and the door was closed and tried the door mom we're here and the door was locked and she was just <laughs> shocked and they knew that mom had this friend but for her mm -hmm. to be faced with the reality and then eventually mom and the boyfriend came out of the room that her 92-year-old mother was sexually active or intimately active, you know, and I think we yes. we need to think of a continuum, don't we? Yes. You, we were talking about the hand massage, yes. that it can be touch, which is not mm -hmm. sexualized exactly. at all. We need touch. And you make you make a good point where a word you just used, which was intimacy. Intimacy is such an important part of our our, our sexual. Mm -hmm. being. And yet, it's, I, we think in America that we focus so much on performance. Mm -hmm. It had, you know, and all of these drugs like Viagra and Cialis is sort of a medicalization mm -hmm. of sexuality, mm -hmm. but it's all about performance and not about intimacy. Mm -hmm. And maybe, you know, older people can lead all of us towards a place that we understand better what intimacy is, because it it's a terribly important part of being a sexual person, but it, it's apt to be the, the issue that nobody wants to talk right. about. And I think more residential communities are realizing that need for intimacy and connection yeah. and that they, as, as an administration, as a facility, don't have a right to say, this will not happen here. Yeah. I remember when my grandfather was in a nursing home that they allowed my grandmother some overnight visits, oh. you know, and some, some closed door visiting time because that was so important to him. And in his dementia, right. it would seem to be the one thing that would calm him. And really? So, yes, I can see that. You know, and, and that's mm -hmm. different for different people. Right. Um, but a recognition of the need for that kind of contact. Well, with uh, all of us living longer and longer, this mm -hmm. is a really important subject. And, you know, I think people who run these institutions are going to have to come up with guidelines and mm -hmm. policies. Maybe you see, maybe they're doing this, and I, but I think this is the kind of a, an effort, the mm -hmm. Consortium for Sexuality and Aging, that can trigger more thought about these issues which are looming yes. for all of us and policy issues on That's the That's great. So policy and research and yeah. in the whole area of sexuality right. and aging right. and, and not buying into that idea that somehow sex stops at 50. Right. <laughs> I was sitting here laughing because, you know, I think so many teenagers rush to have sex thinking that that's the only time in their lives that they're going to be mm -hmm. able to have it. Mm -hmm. And if we can sort of get through, the, <laughs> if we can do a big, huge timeline say, mm -hmm. you know, you can have sex all the way through your lives. You don't have to go rushing into it, with, particularly at 13 and 14, you know. that. I think also with, with age, and we're all aging from the day we're born, that's right. but with age, our definition of sexuality changes. And as you say, if we can that part of your effort here sounds like a way of opening up that definition that we're not talking about this very narrowly defined act exactly. and performance and achieving a goal but um, but a much broader definition of what we need and what being a who sexual we are. A, a truly <laughs> sexual person is Be, you know when you think about that Viagra ad that puts that great big emphasis on, I think it's Viagra or Cialis, if you have a four-hour erection, get in oh, touch yeah. with somebody. But that's 
what it is mm -hmm. and the whole idea that of plastic surgery now that you know you have to get rid of your wrinkles mm -hmm. or you if if some part of your body is unsightly then you have to have tucks and operations and things like that mm -hmm. rather than forgetting all of that it, a friend of mine once said the heart has no wrinkles <laughs> oh I love that <laughs> Well, I think it's lovely. Maybe that should be the subhead yeah. for older, wiser, sexually smarter. But I think if we can keep focused on that, and then it, we'll get away from some of these very narrow right. uh, interpretations of being a sexual right. person. I want to move into another area, though, because in my work, one of the things that I'm aware of is that um, people do have this need for connection, and that people are meeting other people. Mm -hmm. and entering into relationships and again the need for the education that goes along with being sexually active after 50. Um, we had a celebration just this week of two people who are who attend a program at the center who are getting married next week um, and you know we had a, another couple who met at one of our activities and got mm -hmm. married and so people are meeting and marrying and I think that the the divorce rates indicate, you know, if 50% of marriages fall apart, and, or 60% of marriages fall apart, 40% remarry, and 50% of them re-divorce, we have a lot of people in sequential relationships throughout their life. Right. So people are meeting, let's say at 55 and 60, they're hooking up, <laughs> so to speak. Now they should not be thinking that because they're no longer of reproductive age that they don't have to worry about anything. So let's talk about some of the concerns and some of the things that you're seeing in older adult risk. No, I think that's very important. It, uh, and that's also included in these lessons, that, 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 that older adults need to know, just as adolescents do, about how to protect yourself mm -hmm. against sexually transmitted infections. And many of them need to also uh, think about getting an HIV test just to make mm -hmm. sure before they enter into a, rela a sexual mm -hmm. relationship that you know both partner neither partner has the virus. The, no, you, we have to work on that too, just as much as we have to. Well, really the HIV work transmission on. rates in residential communities are very high because I think shocking. Ex ex exactly, I think people, older people, don't think they're at risk, but mm -hmm. sadly. You know, you can't tell by looking at someone whether they have the virus. But uh, the United States And we States do has find there's also statistical evidence that because there are so many more women than men, that there are some men who have multiple girlfriends exactly. that they're surfacing, sleeping <laughs> with, um, and that the risk, therefore, of sexually transmitted diseases goes up even more. Exactly. The other thing we have to make sure, and there's a wonderful lesson in the book, is that um, sexuality for old for older people are for not only for heterosexual people mm -hmm. we've been sort of focusing on, on heterosexual people but uh, also for homosexual mm -hmm. people and gay lesbian bisexual uh, older adults are oh, there's a wonderful lesson about that too mm -hmm. so we have to be sensitive in care um, mm -hmm. surroundings to make sure that their needs mm -hmm. uh, and are, are met and that, uh, that that they're not discriminated against in Absolutely. any way. So that I is something that, but they too have to be careful about, you know, the same sexually transmitted diseases mm -hmm. and various things like that. And issues of abuse and violence and, um, and unwanted sex and rape, I mean, these are issues that, you know, unfortunately are part of the whole continuum of, of mm -hmm. sexuality. So we we have to be aware that those we have to discuss those things right. I was thinking of that part of it also when we were talking about um, residential communities and I think that the staff are balancing an, an awareness a recognition of the need for intimacy between people gay or straight yeah. and the desire to protect people that they feel are vulnerable yeah, exactly. and how do you judge what a person's intentions are and here again comes the important role of education, yeah. education of families, education of staff, and education of the older adults who are involved. Right. I've always thought that everyone in the 
helping profession, whether you're a nurse or a social worker or an educator, should have a basic course in human sexuality as part of their training. Mm -hmm. Because I think it would make them all much more careful and, and, and cognizant of these issues. And you know? comfortable. And comfortable. You have to use right. the language yeah. for a while to be comfortable nope. Absolutely. using it with someone else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But the, the lessons in, the, in, the, in this book are enlightening and informative and entertaining. There's a wonderful <laughs> lesson about jokes. <laughs> about, you know, there's so many re, re sort of, you know, jokes about mm -hmm. older people and, and sexuality. They're not... Usually, usually not very complimentary. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, they, again, as you say, education, they mm -hmm. face the joke so that people can really talk about it. And sometimes that's, people are uncomfortable talking about sexuality when it pertains to themselves. If it's in the form of a joke, you know, then which they can laugh and sort of nudge people. It, it's a way to break barriers and things like that. So there's a lot of, these are very entertaining lessons. They really are enlightening and entertaining. And you talk about it, and, and clearly the book is put together like a textbook yes, with it, lessons. Yes. And so I'm wondering, are you finding that um, there are classes? Are people teaching this curriculum as a class anywhere? Is it something that we could do at the Senior Resource Center? Um, what helps people be brave enough to come? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it would be great at the Princeton Senior Resource Center. You, you, you're a pioneer in so many ways, really. And why not try this? Mm -hmm. I think in the beginning, my hunch is that you won't have a great outpouring of people if you announce this. I could be wrong, yeah. but um, you know, if you got a, maybe 10 or something the first time and ran through some of the lessons and then sort of processed them and, and really found out whether they were people like them, my hunch is that you could really build on this so that you could keep doing this. I think this will become a, a real movement in the mm -hmm. United States. I mm -hmm. just think that this has been so beautifully put together and people are finally waking up to the fact that we are sexual from birth to death. Yeah. So, Well, this you're is a the real next pioneer stage. in this. <laughs> <laughs> in your work on this, was there anything that was a surprise to you? Um, I'm trying to think, was, anything, was there a surprise for anybody who's been in this field for as long as I've been? Yeah. Was it a surprise to me? Um, no, or I, a particularly I, poignant? Well, piece. all the stories are, mm -hmm. that I, I find are, are poignant. But um, the four people who created this book are such superb sex educators. Mm -hmm. I've known their work for years and years and years. And I knew in their hands it would be done so very well. Mm -hmm. um, so, so far I haven't, you know, come across something that's sort of been sh surprising or, or shocking. Maybe mm -hmm. if I taught one of these uh, classes. Mm -hmm. I remember once I taught a group of adults, this is slightly off the subject, but uh, they kept diaries mm -hmm. and one woman who was a teacher wrote in a diary that showed me the story. She said that she was at college and her father had asked her what she was learning in biology class mm -hmm. and she said, oh, we learned the male reproductive uh, system. And then she ticked off the names of the, the penis, the testicles, mm -hmm. all of those things. He got up, crossed the room and slapped her across mm -hmm. the face and said, um, if you ever speak like that in front of me, I'm going to, I'm not going to pay for your next uh, to, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not going to pay tuition school. Mm -hmm. That was so shocking to me that I, I thought to myself, I never would have gotten that though if she hadn't written a diary for yeah. me. And but it, things like that are what really surprised me mm -hmm. that people's feelings about sex can be so negative and so hidden and, and contorted mm -hmm. that they can hurt other people, and that's very disappointing. Well, and the sad thing is that we end up piecing together a sexual awareness uh, sometimes filled with misinformation. Yeah. That doesn't end with adolescence. When we become sexual ac sexually active, we still 
have misconceptions about anatomy, about how things work, about what works, what doesn't work, about what's okay and what isn't okay. And I, I think it's wonderful that you and this group and, and this um, consortium are working to open up this conversation and, and have people at least explore it for themselves, if not share these stories with other people and to um, well, to help us acknowledge the, yeah. the depth of experience throughout the lifespan. And I know these four will constantly keep evaluating these mm -hmm. lessons. If they find there are mistakes or they're not working or people really just are on, really have a higher degree of discomfort about these subjects and they are estimating, they'll change these lessons, I know. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, they, they'll really listen to the, the population of, older ad adults and really try to meet their needs. Well, that's part of the feedback loop, isn't it? If we can begin to offer these yeah. classes, then we as facilitators get more of the stories, more of the information, more of an idea about what people want to know more about and can feed that back to the instructors yeah. who build the curriculum. And right. So if people are interested in getting this, we have, we'll have the information up at the end of the show. Um, let people know where they can get their own copy and yeah. explore it. Yeah. Um, I, actually, if, even if you just read it through, mm -hmm. uh, um, it's in lesson form, but I think you can come out uh, learning a great deal. Mm -hmm. But I think you learn more when you're with a group mm -hmm. of old, other older adults. Yes. So. Susie, thank you so much for joining me. This has been very informative, and I hope we can begin to get that message out into the community and um, that in the next year we can get a class started and see what the response is. So thank you very much for joining oh, me. Oh, thank you, Susan, very much.